Hello, and welcome to part 3a of this series of video talks on gynecological imaging. So, previously we've spoken about follicular cysts and hemorrhagic cysts within the ovary, but today what we're going to do is just depart from the ovary for a moment and talk about some cystic structures next to it which may cause diagnostic confusion. Now, there's no easy place to put these in this series of talks, so I thought we'd just get on with them. So we'll talk about peritoneal inclusion cyst, some abnormalities of the appendix which can be confused with uh, gynecological conditions, the fallopian tube and some miscellaneous conditions such as lymphocytes and neural cysts. And I think we'll break this into two talks because otherwise it'll be a bit long. So first of all we're going to talk about peritoneal inclusion cysts. So what are these? Well, peritoneal inclusion cysts are really just an area of loculated ascites. It's as simple as that. And they tend to form in the peritoneal cavity when there's been some inflammatory change or post-operative change. Usually the patient will have a previous history of surgery or sometimes of peritoneal dialysis. And inflammatory adhesions will wall off an area of the peritoneal cavity and fluid will slowly accumulate. So if we look at this patient here who had a history of pelvic surgery, this rather just looks like an ordinary ovarian cyst. It's got that egg-shaped configuration, sometimes they can be uh, round or oval, and it has simple contents internally. This is just reverberation artifact, but you might just say this was a simple ovarian cyst and you couldn't be contradicted for doing so. However, if you look at it at a slightly different angle, you can see it doesn't demonstrate the perfectly oval configuration. It has some rather irregular margins in places here and there's some beaking of the uh, wall of the fluid collection. And this is a very characteristic feature of a peritoneal inclusion cyst because a peritoneal inclusion cyst, if you look at this patient here on MRI, will have its walls at least in part defined according to the margins of the peritoneal cavity rather than just sticking to the to the um, round, oval or egg-shaped configuration of a simple ovarian cyst. Here's the same patient a bit further down. You can see how the fluid collection conforms its margins to the wall of the peritoneal cavity. So this is a very characteristic feature to look out for. Here's another patient. Again, there isn't a perfectly oval configuration to this fluid collection. And you can see when we bring it next to the ovary that it's not actually arising from the ovary, it's rather just sitting next to it. We've also got that rather beaked configuration here as the fluid collection is outlined in this portion by the peritoneal cavity. Now, it doesn't tend, what distinguishes it from regular ascites is it tends to push other structures away. Whereas ascites will accept other structures coming into, into it uh, without any complaint. So you'll often see a bowel loop protruding into an area of ascites, but you won't see that in a peritoneal inclusion cyst. And that's why they look different, and people don't generally tend to call them ascites. They, tend to, they often tend to call them ovarian cysts uh, erroneously, and that, of course, triggers, puts the patient in a diagnostic pathway which they shouldn't be in. Here's another patient with a peritoneal inclusion cyst. They have a fluid collection which is relatively well-defined and round, and it's got these bands or adhesions internally which are very commonly seen in peritoneal inclusion cyst, which is essentially an inflammatory pathology. If we angulate the probe a bit, we can see, however, that there is the beak-shaped configuration here, and it's not quite a round or oval appearance that we might expect from a simple ovarian cyst. And the same here, it's got a rather tubular configuration on the sagittal view, and the ovary here, this was felt to be the ovary, is separate from it. And if we look on MRI, you can see a volume of fluid in the peritoneal cavity in the pelvis with some bands, and here's that ovary sitting within the peritoneal cavity. One more example here, this is a lady who had necrotizing enterocolitis when she was um, a baby and that was um, she had a colon resection following that and did have uh, grumbling pain uh, 
uh, for many years, and as a, when a young adult, then presented actually with a, uh, with a to, with pain to the um, emergency department, and a CT scan was performed, and um, then subsequently this ultrasound examination demonstrating a large amount of fluid in the abdomen and pelvis, and you can see the left ovary here bathed in fluid. It's a normal-looking ovary and the right ovary bathed in fluid here. So this is a very large peritoneal inclusion cyst and I'm just going to show you the CT scan she had. This I think is the top of the uterus and these are two ovaries here and as we go higher up you can see there's still a very large amount of fluid higher up again in the abdomen a large amount of fluid and it's only when we get up to the upper abdomen here around the liver and spleen that the fluid's no longer visible. Let's look at the coronal picture and you can see this is the upper demarcation of the fluid. So if this is loculated ascites confined to the lower part of the abdomen and the pelvis. And this is a rather extreme case of a peritoneal inclusion cyst and you can see this ovary here bathed within the fluid. And if I contrast this with a patient who has malignant ascites due to pseudomyxoma peritonei, here on the coronal picture you can see the ascites passes up into the um, into the upper abdomen. So peritoneal inclusion cysts, just to summarize, it's nothing more than loculated ascites. It's not based on the ovary. The ovary may be bathed within the fluid internally, but it's not arising from the ovary. It conforms to the peritoneal cavity in margins, at least some of the margins, and there's a history of pelvic surgery or peritoneal dialysis. So let's move on now just to talk a bit about the appendix. Of course, uh, the main pathology that we encounter in the appendix is acute appendicitis. In, certainly in our institution, we usually do CT in adults to diagnose this because it's more uh, reproducible, um, particularly uh, it's, it's more accurate, particularly in obese patients, and it may display alternative diagnoses. Um, so, but this, but sometimes patients won't present with an acute appendicitis typical picture that is coming to a head within 72 hours within perforation, with perforation and gradually gradually getting worse. They may follow a more subacute course like this patient. So this patient presented with two to three weeks history of um, right-sided pelvic pain, and they were actually sent for a an outpatient ultrasound which demonstrates this rather tubular structure here with some low signal, low echogenicity areas of uh, varying um, density internally. So it just, there was a rather non-specific um, report given here. The operator wasn't sure what this is. Anything with a tubular shape like this, you certainly want to consider the appendix. It is said that one of the characteristic features of the appendix, which distinguishes it from gynecological masses, is that it can be equally, equally well seen transabdominally as transvaginally in contrast to, um, to uh, gynecological masses which are seen better transvaginally than they are transabdominally. So this patient went on to have a CT scan and you can see it's a multiloculated fluid collection based around the appendix and this was in fact an appendix abscess which was subsequently drained by one of my colleagues and the patient made a full recovery. So an appendix abscess is something that you want to be looking out for with when you see a tubular shaped abnormality in the right iliac fossa. Here's another patient who presented with a three month history. This rather looks more like an acute condition but they did have three months of symptoms before they uh, presented and underwent uh, ultrasound and then CT scan. This shows us a fluid collection in the right iliac fossa seen nicely on the transabdominal scan. These foci internally you might think would be air and you'd be right about that. Here's our sagittal view. This is transvaginally and uh, so there's a transvaginal view and we're seeing the structure in a more sagittal plane. This is probably the cecum here in front, and this is, uh, although it's not that easy to say that just from this picture, and this is a retrocecal appendix abscess. And here we can see that on the CT scan with some uh, air foci within the abscess. And here it is on the sagittal view. You can see the abscess here posterior to the cecum. 
And I just thought I'd mention in passing that sometimes the terminal ileum can have a rather suspicious appearance if it's got a bit of fluid in it. If it's pure fu fluid, it's usually quite easy to tell, but sometimes if it's partly contracted or it's some solid material, it can have quite a suspicious appearance, and you might think that it's a um, distended fluid-filled appendix. Often the coronal view can be very helpful because the terminal ileum has a sometimes has a very characteristic entry into the cecum through the ileocecal valve with the, a little bit of fat around it here and this is a very characteristic appearance so if you can match this up to the axial appearance that can often be very helpful in distinguishing in, in confirming that what you think is the terminal ileum a normal slightly atypical appearing terminal ileum actually is and it's nice to practice that on um, uh, it's, uh, as you look through scans being performed for other reasons um, so that when you see a difficult case you'll be able to, you'll be more confident. At least that's what I've certainly found. Let's look at another patient who um, was being scanned for follow-up of an ovarian cyst um, and somebody noticed this. It's, it hadn't been noted previously um, or perhaps it had but incorrectly interpreted but it certainly hadn't been mentioned before. They noted this structure here which is, has, has clearly got some fluid material internally in the right iliac fossa because there's some acoustic enhancement behind it but it looks like there's some more solid material as well and when they turn this into longitudinal section it looks rather tubular so it's not dissimilar to that appendix we saw earlier but this was a patient who was um, perfectly well and healthy they didn't have any acute complaints so it wasn't clear what this was the patient underwent a CT scan and here's the CT scan showing that tubular structure and it was possible to follow this all the way up to the cecum. So what this is is a mucosal of the appendix and this is a condition which not many people seem to know about but it's very important that you should do because you have to identify it correctly so that it can be treated accordingly. This is a uh, usually a low-grade tumour within the appendix causes a lot of mucin production and distends up the appendix and it can uh, perforate and discharge mucinous material into the peritoneal cavity which can then cause pseudomyxoma peritonei. And pseudomyxoma peritonei of course is a very difficult condition to treat so we'd rather prevent this than have to treat it afterwards and if we can, if we can identify this while it's still confined to the appendix it can be treated with right hemicolectomy. And it's important that we identify it so that the correct um, surgeon can perform the procedure because we don't want to have a gynecologist operate on the patient thinking it's a fallopian tube and be faced with this and perhaps cut into it. We want the case to be dealt with by a colorectal surgeon who can, who can do one operation and do a hemicolectomy and remove it intact so no, no, mucin, no mucin spills out. So that's a mucinous tumour of the appendix causing a mucosal. And I'm going to just show you a few more of those because I think it's such an important condition to identify because it's a great opportunity for us to actually prevent a uh, bit of a catastrophe. Here's another patient with the same condition. This was given to me by uh, Helen, one of the sonographers. And this looks rather unusual. And this transvaginal scan, it looks rather like a gallbladder, I would have thought. Uh, with a slightly different angulation you can see it's actually got concentric rings here and this pattern these concentric rings here are essentially pathognomonic of a mucosal of the appendix because they're layers of mucus which have been laid down in turn so if you see that you can be pretty happy that what you're looking at is a mucinous uh, is a mucosal of the appendix which is likely to be to be due to an underlying mucinous tumor and you can report that accordingly Here's a patient who was incidentally noted to have a small cystic structure in the right pelvis. You might think it was an ovarian cyst, but in fact it traced back to the appendix, and this is a small mucosal here. Here's another patient who was asymptomatic. Here it's got a the patient has a rather tubular structure, perhaps a bit short, but there is acoustic enhancement behind it, which tells us that this is rather likely to be thick fluid material than solid material uh, this acoustic enhancement so this was again a mucosal of the 
appendix. I'm just going to show you the uh, transverse view here. Uh, I'd always tell people try and take some pictures without annotation on it because you can't remove the annotation like this afterwards. Take one picture with and one without, otherwise people won't be able to scrutinize your studies. I don't see the concentric layers of mucus here particularly, but you can see the calcified margin on the CT scan which is often seen in mucinous tumours and this was another mucinous tumour of the appendix. And you can see that it has a slightly thicker density internally than just pure fluid. I'm just going to contrast that with a fallopian tube. This is a patient with a hydrosalpinx, just to show you the slightly different appearance that a hydrosalpinx classically has from a mucosal of the appendix. I appreciate this is on the left side, but I didn't have such a, um, uh, I didn't have a right side uh, fallopian tube hydrosalpinx in this configuration. So it's this has a very thin wall. It sometimes has have a rather lobulated contour, and the fluid here appears um, is, is of rather water density. You can of course measure that with your Hansfield units. So that's a mucin. That's a that's the appendix. Look out for appendix abscess. Uh, if you have a subacute um, appendix, one where there's an appendix abscess, that can present. Um, as a supposed gynecological abnormality and be on the lookout for mucosal of the appendix which is often due to an underlying low-grade tumour and we need to identify that so it can be removed without spillage. So I think we're going to end that part there and we'll continue with the rest of these cystic densities in part two. So thank you very much for watching.